This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated online cinema streaming exceptional films from around the globe. Get one month free at MUBI.com slash Cinema Tyler. It's early 1933. The Nazis just banned Fritz Lang's film, The Testament of Dr. Mabuza, for having an insane criminal ghost spouting Nazi slogans in the film. But it just seemed to fit so well. Propaganda minister and all-round douche Joseph Goebbels called Lang to visit him in his office. But instead of the slap on the wrist that Lang expected, Goebbels offered him the position at the head of the entire German film industry. Lang, a half-Jewish man, was like, that sounds great, not, and split Germany for Paris, later continuing his directing career in the United States. But as you'll remember, there's some inconsistencies in Lang's story. Wait, can I just ask one question about Fritz Lang before we begin? Fine. So he wore that monocle, right? And that's like a fancy rich guy thing to do. But like, it's gotta cost less than a frame and like a second lens. And you have to like squeeze it in between your like eyebrow and your cheek. What was his insurance like? Are we really doing this right now? All right, all right. Some information has come to light from the Deutsche Kinematek and the German Film Museum's program director, Ronnie Lowe. First off, the timeline of his initial meeting with Goebbels doesn't work but we can chalk that up to a faulty memory. The Nazis took power on January 30th, 1933, and the new German censorship under Goebbels didn't start until March 14th. The Testament of Dr. Mabuza was still not quite finished, so it hadn't yet been submitted to the Ministry of Propaganda for review. Wait a second, something doesn't add up. I thought he went in to see Goebbels because his film was already banned, but he said that he met with Goebbels at the beginning of March. So how had Goebbels seen the film if it wasn't even finished? Here's where the timeline of his story is off. The premiere was supposed to take place on March 24th, but it was due to reach the censors that same day. The next station was the announced premiere of the film. Sämtliche Litfaßsäulen in the near of the Kurfürstendammes and the des Bahnhof Zoos, where the Uraufführungskino was, were gemietet and were with Plakaten from the Testament of Knummer Bus übersät. On March 29th, the German Board of Film Censors banned the film for the reason that it, quote, constituted a threat to law and order and public safety. Goebbels said that the film, quote, showed that an extremely dedicated group of people are perfectly capable of overthrowing any state with violence. Well, you wouldn't want that to happen. Did Goebbels think that people didn't already know they could do that? Like, people are watching the movie going like, Wait a second, we can just rise up against these motherfuckers. The Testament of Dr. Mabuza was still released outside of Germany, and a French version was first shown in France in April. Now, here is where it gets interesting. The day before Goebbels banned the Testament of Dr. Mabuza, he invited the cream of the crop of the German film industry, producers, directors, and technical staff, to meet with him at the Hotel Kaiserhof. And according to reports, Fritz Lang was there. After all, Lang was a devout nationalist, and just the day before the meeting, he had a part in founding the NSBO, a National Socialist Directing Group with three other filmmakers. Hold on, I thought Lang was anti-Nazi, but he founded a Nazi directing group? Apparently so. It has been said that at this time, Lang had no intention of leaving Germany, but we'll get to that later. At the meeting, Goebbels pointed out four films that made, quote, an indelible impression on him. The films are The Battleship Potemkin by Sergei Eisenstein, Anna Karenina, the American version, Fritz Lang's Die Nibelungen, and Der Rebel by Louis Trenkner. He thought that the Battleship Potemkin in particular was a great model for communicating the power of a political idea. That said, there is no mention in Goebbels' highly detailed diaries of him offering Lang the position at the head of the German film industry. In fact, Lang isn't mentioned in Goebbels' diary for 1933 at all. The timeline really starts to get muddied when we look at Lang's escape. Looking at Lang's passport dated from its issue date in 1931 to its expiration in 1936, there are no visas or exit stamps for the months of February, March, and the beginning of April in 1933. The only exit visa on Lang's passport during that time was on June 23, 1933. So he had not left Germany in the months before that point. There are several visas for Lang's trips to Belgium and Berlin at the end of June and July 1933. Currency exchange transactions placed Lang in Berlin on the 26th and 27th of June, as well as July 20th. According to these transactions, Lang went back to Berlin after his time abroad and finally left on July 31st, 1933. Apparently Goebbels, on his 36th birthday in October of 1933, 
screened for his guests Lang's banned film, The Testament of Dr. Mabuza. Lang became an American citizen in 1939 and ultimately made 23 movies in the States over a period of 20 years. Many of these movies were very anti-Nazi. For example, the opening of 1941's Manhunt shows a sport hunter who manages to get Hitler in his crosshairs just for the fun of it. David Kerr points out that Lang's close-up shots of hands were usually performed by Lang himself. So this shot of the finger on the trigger could very well have been Lang holding the rifle. It should also be noted that Manhunt was released while America was still neutral in the war in Europe. It would be six months before they would join the fight. I, I don't get it. If Fritz Lang was anti-Nazi, then why would he need to lie about his escape from Nazi Germany? Lang had to make a name for himself in Hollywood. Many Americans hadn't seen his masterpieces like M or Metropolis, and if they had, they had seen versions that were heavily cut down from their original runtimes. But above all, he had to show America that not only was he not a Nazi, he never was. It wouldn't look so good if he appeared to waffle on his decision to leave. Some have argued that his 1927 epic, Metropolis, was a pro-Nazi film. Two of these arguers were Hitler and Goebbels themselves, who loved the film. Hitler even said that he related to the main character. However, Ellie Hoffman argues that Metropolis is, in fact, an anti-Nazi film. It is true that Lang's wife at the time, Thea von Harbo, a member of the Nazi party, wrote the screenplay, and she stayed behind when Lang left Germany. They divorced when he left, and she continued writing pro-Nazi screenplays during their reign. Talk about your strange bedfellows. But as Hoffman points out, many of the ideals the film puts forth go completely against the ideals of the Third Reich. First, the Fuhrer was seen as infallible and godlike. In Metropolis, Friedersen, in his position as the unquestioned leader of New Babylon, is seen as flawed and needing to answer to the citizens. Second, the film never uses race in its message of equality among the social classes. The Nazis wanted to unite the German people by considering themselves a superior race. And third, whereas the Nazis used technology for the war effort in ridding themselves of the Jewish people and other groups, the actual technological advances that were made were mostly useless for increasing the quality of life for its citizens. Metropolis sees technology as a way to make everyone's lives better, not to capture new territory and exterminate its people. So maybe Hitler and Goebbels were just projecting their own skewed ideals into their reading of Metropolis. Maybe they thought it fit with their vision so well that they were willing to forgive the dissent in the testament of Dr. Mabuza and coax Germany's most visionary director back to their side. Right. The problem was that he was never on their side to begin with. Perhaps Lang actually flirted with the idea of remaining in Germany. Or perhaps he only left because he was afraid at how long he might last as a half-Jewish citizen of Hitler's Germany. Biographers have said that he took six months to leave Germany so he could do it, quote, without causing himself too much trouble. Nevertheless, it isn't hard to see a connection between the ideas put forth in the testament of Dr. Mabuza and his decision to leave Germany. Lang once said, It is not so much that a character reaches a goal or that he conquers this goal. What is important is his fight against it. Look, when you put your finger on something, on an evil, you're not a politician, you cannot change it. But if you put your finger on an evil, which still exists, that's it. A special thanks to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated cinema streaming service for everything from art house to cinema classics. What's cool is that Mubi hosts just 30 hand-picked films. Every day they present a new film, and every day they take one away. It's so fun to check the site and see what new movie has been selected that day. They even put together special collections that celebrate specific auteurs and categories. And they just recently added Two Days, One Night, starring Marion Cotillard. I've been really wanting to see this one for a while now. Finally, a streaming service that is above all, streamlined. Try Mubi for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinematyler. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash cinematyler for your extended free trial. Thanks for watching the exciting conclusion of Fritz Lang's Escape from Nazi Germany. I don't know about you guys, but I do not like the Nazis. Anyways, I want to send a special thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. With your support, you really make this channel possible. If you're not yet a patron, Head on over there now, you can get access to my research materials, unedited transcripts, and you can get early access to videos. Thanks again for watching.